course, so this is fantastic. Despite the fact this is online, I hope that in the future I can be there in person. So, so this is a joint work with Sonia Balotra, who's from University of Essex, also a regular visitor to the ISI conference. Damien Clark, who is at the University of Santiago in Chile. Uh, and Athin Venkataramani, who is at UPenn. He's, a, he's actually a medical doctor and, and an economist. So this is about maternal mortality. And the first thing that I want to start with is showing you this map of how maternal mortality rates look across the world. So our sample is uh, across, from across the world from 1990 to 2015. And I'll talk more about the sample later. And this is a bit how the average maternal mortality rates look like uh, around the world. You will see there are vast inequalities. Of course, there's concentration in sub-Saharan Africa. But what this map does not show you is also there have been lots of declines in different places, and there's inequality in the declines in these rates across the country. Uh, maternal mortality rates are actually very high. There are about 300,000 million deaths in 2015. Unfortunately, that's only the tip of the iceberg, the mass of which is, the, is maternal morbidity, so a lot more women suffer due to pregnancy and pregnancy related causes. And the other thing that is striking is that maternal mortality in places like sub-Saharan Africa today actually exceed maternal mortality rates a century ago in richer countries. So if I can show you these data from the World Bank, this is from uh, the, the, you know, our data, world in data where you can go and play around with these data. So this is the United, this is the United States, this is Finland in the last 100, 150, 15 years. This is Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the world. So if you notice that the rates in contemporary Sub-Saharan Africa are actually higher than what the, the rates were in, in the US and in developing, developed countries more than 100 years ago when we did not have the technology to solve these issues. So if, if I haven't actually technically defined yet, so maternal mortality ratio is the, the number of women who died from pregnancy related causes, either while pregnant or within 42 days of pregnancy termination. And this is defined per 100,000 live births. This is the definition from the WHO. But the point of this graph is if you notice that the rates in Sub-Saharan Africa, even in 2015, which is when our data stops, uh, data stop is almost, is as high as the rates in the early, uh, before the 1940s. So what happened in the 1940s is that in 1937, uh, the first antibiotics, the sulfa drugs came around and they reduced maternal mortality rates drastically because a lot of women were dying from puperal sepsis. There's uh, Sima Jayachandran's paper, which you might know, but also better hygiene practices and hospitals became safer in general. So these kind of things happened. And then in the developed world, these rates drastically fell with the caveat that I must tell you that the US is one of the only developed countries where the rates have been going up in the last year. So that's a different question, which we're not going to directly talk about here. But just as a, as a matter of fact, you should know that that's, that's going up. And it's, it's kind of surprising. We don't know why that is happening. But the point just is that, I... yeah. So in the blue line, what is this sudden jump around 1940? So this jump that going yeah. high, I do not know. This is Finland. Okay. I do not know anyway. My paper is not about that. The point okay. is that over the years, it has been falling from the 1940s. I don't know what this jump is, honestly. But it's interesting. I don't know. This is Finland. But the idea is that after that, from the 40s, it, it started falling. Uh, just a, uh, Joseph, are these, like when you compared the past with the sub-Saharan Africa now, are these for comparable fertility rates? This is, no, the fertility rates would also be different, but uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the fertility rates would be, I have not checked, but it will probably be comparable to the fertility rates that were there in the early 1900s and 1930s in the US. But so that's my question. question. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, should, we should actually have a look at that, but I, I would not be surprised if they're comparable. Okay, so the point is that maternal mortality rates are still very high across the world. Sub-Saharan Africa is where it's concentrated, but in the place like India as well, it's, it's pretty high. The Millennium Development Goals targeted 75% reduction by 2015. It did not happen. Actual reduction was 44%. The Sustainable Development Goals actually want to double down. So by 1930, they want to get it, they, they want to double down. So we, we really need to think about policy innovations actually achieve that, right? Because we couldn't meet the Millennium Development Goals. 
Now, one thing you might be thinking about as well, uh, you know, you're not talking about income. You know, if I look at that map, there's a clear divide between the rich countries and the poor countries. It's true. But maternal mortality rates are actually pretty high uh, conditional on income. You know, so we don't obviously, if we think of life expectancy rates, for example, so if you plot female life expectancy rates across, uh, uh, along, uh, along GDP, then obviously there's a positive slope there. And female life expectancy rates, of course, many things contribute to it. Maternal mortality is one of the things that contribute to it. But if you plotted male life expectancy like this, you would also see a positive slope like this. But if you plotted female to male life expectancy, you see that kind of breaks down that relationship. So it's the point I'm trying to make these differences in female to male life expectancy might Uh, Joseph, you're frozen. Aviation and maternal mortality. So then we might think of, I mean, what the, what, what the problem is? Is it a resource problem? So if you talk to people like Bill Gates and his foundation, the WHO, they will tell you things like, oh, it's about access to health clinics, skilled, uh, access to skilled birth attendants, obstetric services, et cetera, et cetera which all that is obviously correct. These are the proximate causes why maternal mortality rates might be high in certain places. But the question is, some of these things have been known for ages. The knowledge, the technology to solve maternal mortality rates has been around for decades, right? And that is why many developed countries have been able to bring these rates down. Then why are maternal mortality rates still so high? So there we ask the question, is it because of the constituency that it affects? Is it because it affects women and maybe we are not prioritizing enough? So for that, I mean, part of the motivation, of course, there's many things that motivate this. Part of the motivation is from this very influential essay by Dr. Bernadine Healy in 1991, where she talks about something called the Yentil syndrome. Of course, her context was about cardiovascular illnesses among women. And her point was that this, she explains it very powerfully through this, this parable about uh, this uh, woman called Yentil, who was, because she was a woman, she was not allowed to read the Talmud. And she had to dress up as a man to read the Talmud. So it's, so the, the idea is that there's always a cost that women had to pay because they're not men. Of course, her context was cardiovascular diseases. And even in contemporary times, actually, if you think of clinical trials on cardiovascular diseases, they're mostly on men, and they don't really reflect the realities of these illnesses among women. So this is of course, our paper is not about cardiovascular illnesses, but this is something that we think about might be something. It's because it's a female specific issue, maybe uh, men, men, male dominant policymakers are not doing enough to solve it. So that's why we hypothesize that it might have something to do with political will. It's, a, it's, it's been a low policy priority and therefore maybe raising the share of women in policymaking can improve this. So what does the literature have to say about this, about policy preferences of women and men? So if you look at this paper from the American Journal of Political Science in 2006, which is about the preferences of female and male legislators in Latin American countries, a bunch of Latin American countries, and they show that while men and women might equally care about the economy, but if you think of issues like women's equality or children and family issues, then clearly women prioritize these a lot more than men do. So you, these, the light colored graphs are from women and the dark colored graphs are from men. And of course, there's, this is political science literature. In the economics literature, there's a bunch of papers showing that increasing investment, increasing the share of women in, in decision-making positions, increase investments in public goods. This is, of course, from, the, from India, this paper by Chattopadhyay and Duflo. They have impacts on health outcomes. There's work by my co-authors Sonia Bhalotra and Irma Klotz on uh, using regression discontinuity design and showing how having an, uh, women being elected at the uh, state level affects these outcomes, neonatal and child health. Of course, and Grant Miller's influential QJE paper on suffrage in the US and how they affected both public health spending and then also how women were campaigning more for uh, you know, information they were doing information campaigns that had a, an effect on child health. So there's all these papers talking about this. And more recently, there have been these fantastic big data case studies. So taking one country, looking at the parliamentary proceedings of those countries, 
This is from France, this is from Germany, and this is from, again, Sonia's paper, a recent paper from UK. And they look at the minutes of the parliament, and they see that having women policymakers makes it more likely to initiate women-related amendments or increasing the time spent on decreasing women-related issues or whether you talk about health or not. So that having women in the parliament actually makes a big difference. So all these I, I have one question here. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, so I mean, it sounds like it's a black box in some sense that uh, you increase the participation of women or give them more decision making power, etc. Then somehow that is going, uh, somehow that is actually improving the situation. Yeah. Has some understanding emerged as to what exactly they do, which is different from what it would have been in the male dominated? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, from this, you can see that they already, the fact that people are talking more about female related issues makes it more likely that, you know, there's descriptive work that more amendments and laws might be passed, uh, which, which would affect the women more than men. But also, if you look at papers like uh, uh, Grant Miller's QJ paper, he talks about after having political voice, expenditure, public health expenditure went up but also information campaigns and women, the door-to-door -door campaigns with information, what you can do with your children, if your children are sick, et cetera, those kind of things have gone up. So there is a lot of work there, which has shown that these things uh, matter, right? And that they, that they make a difference. Now the black box of this paper, maybe we can hold it off and see a bit later what we think is going on, right? But yes, there is a lot of papers showing that having women in power does lead to more women-related amendments, for example. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about this literature. Yes. Yeah, uh, my name is Somanathan, by the way. Uh, the, you know, one concern I have with this uh, sort of literature that basically says, okay, here's a variable, and then now we find that when you change this variable, you get these and such and such outcomes. But that approach is sort of vulnerable to cherry picking, right? Because you can look at the outcomes that turn out to have a, an effect in your particular study or data. So when we look at this whole literature, how do we know that it hasn't been cherry picked? So for example, the first paper you cited, the Chattopadhyay and Duflo, I believe there have been other papers in India after that that looked at the same randomizations at the village level and had different results. So it was not the same outcomes that were found to be significant, but some different ones. I see. So, well, the thing is that I can't defend somebody else's paper or I, I don't know enough to- No, the question it. is about the literature, the whole process by which you come to such a conclusion by looking at the literature. How do you safeguard against cherry picking? Given that there are many people outcomes you could examine every time you say, okay, We'll put women in positions of power and through this quasi experiment. And then we see what, we look at various outcomes. And then you report on the outcomes that, you know, favor your hypothesis. And if they don't, then you don't find it interesting. So you don't write a paper about it. Yeah, I understand your concern. But to, to, honestly, the starting point of our paper was to think about maternal mortality as a female specific issue. And when we started working on this paper early in 2014, actually, that's how it started as a bigger project on gender inequality and health outcomes. And we looked at maternal mortality because it was something that was specifically affecting women. Sonia actually presented our initial paper where we were looking at many different samples from different countries on maternal mortality and female to life, male life expectancy rates in, in a, at the ISI Delhi conference that year in 2014. But since then, uh, several things have changed. First, we were finding that maternal mortality rates are consistently... Yeah, but you know, I, you're not answering my question. So your paper, I quite understand. You have a particular outcome in mind, that's maternal mortality. And I, I think your paper is not vulnerable to the particular concern that I was expressing. But this whole literature that you've cited does appear to be. Yeah, it, it may or may not be possible. I, I cannot uh, take the burden of defending the entire literature on my, upon myself. I can only go as much as defending my paper, if you allow me that. So, okay. Yeah, so, no, but what I was, the point I was trying to make is that the reason we, so we started looking at 
what can be done to reduce this maternal mortality rate? It was clear that it was, you know, related to different gender inequality outcomes. And that is how we started looking into this literature. And we saw that, you know, having more women in policy might affect the kind of things that I'm talking about. They might be paying more attention to female specific problems. And of course, nowadays there's so much data, you can always go up and look whether it has been cherry picked or not. But I, I would rather not answer that because it's not something I can defend for the whole literature. All right. Just have one, one question from my Yes. Yeah. Uh, would you isolate the, the representation effect uh, of women from, uh, you know, what I would say the engagement effect, meaning that, you know, over time, more and more women are also getting engaged in women. So that sort of is a latent variable. They are parts. They are sort of uh, more associated with parties, engaged in local political activities, etc. Which is sort of separate the, the the representation aspect. And both would have independent effect on outcome. And both are kind of increasing over time. Let, let's 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 hold that on because if I don't answer it later, please remind me. But maybe if you see the next few slides, it will partly answer your question. If that's all okay. right. Okay, so uh, are so are people also writing the chat questions? I don't know how it works. So if, if somebody's asking a question, they always unmute themselves and ask, right? Is that how it right? Uh, right. People should just unmute and ask. But again, let's keep it to the clarificatory questions. Otherwise, they'll never finish. I see. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So in this paper, what what we are going to do is to we try to investigate the the causal relationship between political participation and maternal mortality. So this is. Our sample is from 1990 to 2015 across the world. These data actually became available. The annual cross country data became available after 2015. In 2016, there is maternal mortality is also not a very well studied issue. Initially, when we started the project, only five yearly data were available. And during this period, 1990 to 2015, maternal mortality fell by 44%. The share of women rose from 10 to 20%. But and we want to see whether these trends are causally related. But you can clearly see the problem here is that how do you isolate? Because this women's share in parliament is moving smoothly and gradually. So to tease out the effect it has on maternal mortality rate is not straightforward. So what we do is that we exploit the abrupt legislation of quotas, which swept through a bunch of uh, low-income countries, developing countries, since 1995 onwards. And I will tell you why they came about and try to see whether these quotas have affected uh, the share of women in parliament and also obviously maternal mortality rate. And we will also examine some underlying mechanisms of how having more women might affect maternal mortality outcomes. So the data in this paper comes from the United Nations um, Interagency Group estimates, the 1990-2015 data. These are, of course, modeled estimates, annual data only, as I said, came about in 2016, up to, and these are available up to 2015. And we take into account the fact these are model estimates. We, uh, they, they're created by Bayesian inference technique. We take into account the confidence intervals. We boost up and stuff, which I can talk about later. We take into account the fact these are model estimates. But to support our hypothesis, we, we also look at alternative data sources. So we're using the micro data from the Demographic and Health Service, which is available for a number of uh, so it's the DHS exists for about 72 countries, out of which about 45, 50 countries have what, what are called the sister files, the sibling files, from which you can construct estimates of maternal mortality rates. And we do that as well and, and, and check whether our results are robust. For country-specific adoption of quotas, until 2005, the data are available from Dal Group, which we updated using the global database for quotas of women. And then we have women in parliament data from a bunch of sources, which we put together. And we have a range of time varying controls, intermediate outcomes, placebo outcomes, mostly from large cross country databases, such as the, the world development indicators. So the quota, so as I said, that we, we, we want to, we actually exploit the standard timing of the implementation of quotas across countries. The question is why did these quotas come about? So in, in 1995, there was this world conference, the, the fourth world conference of women in Beijing, where they talked about a new agenda for women's empowerment and recommended 30% of parliamentary seats for women. 
as a means to combat both explicit and structural biases that reduce women's representation. So after that, a number of countries passed quotas and sometimes selling it to 30%, many times not. So these are the countries that had reserve seats. So we are talking essentially about quotas which are reserve seats. So X percentage of the parliament has to be reserved for women, which is this light ye yellow color, right? Which you see places like China, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, and a bunch of other places which have this. There is another kind of quotas, which are candidate list quotas. And these quotas are essentially in several other countries, particularly in Latin America, where uh, political parties are legally required to field a certain number of women in their candidate list, right? So, of course, we, we also test whether this makes a difference and we find weak effects. And this is not surprising because there are a bunch of papers which show that even if you have women in, in candidate lists, they do not always get converted into women getting elected. So we can talk about that later. But essentially, there are two types of quotas. And we are looking at reserve seats, which were passed by 22 countries. And starting, so I must say, since 1995, 21 countries have passed these quotas until 2015. Uganda is the only country which already had quotas. So it, it, in our sample, in the DID language, it's, it's a country that's always treated. So that was in 1989, so it's always treated. There were uh, 95 onwards after the World Conference, a bunch of countries passed from across the world, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here's the list of the countries which, which have passed the quotas. And here's the kind of the shares that some, some countries have actually fixed it at 30, some others have not. So they vary between 5% to 30%. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, parliaments across the world are equally powerful, and I think they are not. So uh, are you able to control for the fact that in certain countries, parliaments are very powerful, in other countries, they are not? Uh, we do. In many of our specifications, we actually, in actually in all our baseline specifications, we always control for regime type and the democracy. Uh, the level of democracy. So I would think that that would partially alleviate your concern because depending on what level of democracy they are, the parliament might or may or may not have more or less power. But if you think of a specific variable, we can always add that. We always had things like democracy and GDP, as I said, in our specification. So this paper is now reject and resubmit. And we have like some four very for long but very helpful uh, referee reports and the referees have asked us to remove all those variables because they think they might also be endogenous so from our baseline they will all go away they don't make a difference but we do control for things like that thank you so so 22 country countries implemented constitutionally protected quotas reserve, reserving seats for women in parliament and we might think if you look at the political science literature we, we, we well we looked at the political science literature to understand what might be happening because some of you might always already be thinking that, yeah, okay, you, you will probably do a dip and dip in this, but what if, you know, the norms have been evolving and you cannot look at that. So we're going to talk about that more elaborately in, in a moment. How Joseph, your video is frozen. Uh, I can't hear you. Seems okay to me. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, the empirical. So instead of using uh, a single coefficient difference in difference model. We use uh, the flexible st event study specification. We estimate a flexible event study specification. Uh, for the, the, this is more for the grad students. You might know that you know, standard two-way fixed effect estimates might be biased when treatment turns on at different times. This is a new goodman bacon paper in 2019. In our case, of course, treatment varies over time. And if treatment does vary over time, there are actually multiple experiments, right? So the people who are treated before can act as controls for the people who are treated later and vice versa. So we can make all sorts of comparisons and the single coefficient DID is a kind of a weighted average of this, which might have a bias, right? So in, and especially so 
when there are heterogeneous treatment effects over time, if the treatment effect changes over time. So instead of that, this looks unnecessarily complex, the, 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 the equation, but essentially what we do, we have the country and year fixed effects, of course, and we have time varying control. But we also, our quota adoption variable, we interact it with a whole range of lags and leads, which will become obvious when you see the graph, so that we can see the, the leads will sh show us that before the arrival of the quota, if there was already a difference between the quota and non-quota countries. So essentially letting us visually inspect the, the parallel trends assumption and we can see yearly how it looks, right? So that's essentially what, what we do. <clears throat> and as, as I've already said, we, we're going to actually scrutinize this assumption of uh, endogenous quota adoption, right? There might be uh, exogenous quota adoption, right? So we are saying this is quasi-random. So this, the difference in differences actually lets us look at if there are free trends and if the parallel trends assumptions hold. But also we were going to use what is now called the honest difference in difference approach where you can allow for violations in the parallel trend assumption. So we do that kind of stuff. We control for predictors of quota legislation from the political science literature. We use partial identification. So using instrumental variables and estimating IV bounds, allowing for violations of the exclusion restrictions, uh, restriction, which again, I'm going to talk about this in detail when I show you the empirical uh, part. We look at it, we do a dose response analysis. So looking within quota countries, whether having a 30, 20 to 30% quota makes a bigger difference than whether having a five to 10% quota. And also we will examine the impacts of weaker types of quotas. The other type of endogeneity that we might think of is measurement. So we might think that, you know, you're saying that MMR uh, measure proper data came about only in 2016 for the last 25 years. So it might be that having more women in parliament also improved the measurement, right? So because this is a female specific problem and if it is indeed that women care more about it, maybe the measurement improved, but we think that would bias the results against us because some of these countries to start with have high MMR rates. So obviously if the measurement improves, we might say the rates going up, right? As the result of women coming. And also we are explicitly going to account for the uncertainty in the estimates of the, the, the maternal mortality, the, the, the mortality estimates of the, the UN. And as I said, we are going to use uh, alternate MMR measurements from, from the DHS. And we also look at a bunch of placebo outcomes, such as male and gender neutral health, health outcomes. And that's essentially how we deal mostly with, with identification. So without further delay, let me come to the, the, the first of the two most important graphs of the paper. I will show you most of the results graph. I, I mean, this is quick. Uh, so, I mean, is there a uh, situation of anticipating that the quotas will be there in some time? That should like, be, could people... Yeah. Th that should be visible. So, it, so, the point is that uh, if there is an anticipation effect, it should we should see it in the pre-trends. And it, it is possible that, suppose women want to do things, but... If they're not in power, maybe they cannot do it. So when the quotas come, that's when they actually act, right? Because they are suddenly in power. Even if they have plans to act on certain things, they might not be able to do it before they come to power. Of course, there's possible to anticipate it. Maybe there's anticipation, but in our graph here, so first for women in parliament, you can see there is a complete absence of pre-trends, right? So this is a difference between quota and non-quota countries for each year prior to the arrival of the quota. So this is minus one. This is the year zero onwards, right? And you see at year zero, there is a sudden jump in the share of women in parliament. So in some sense, this is like the compliance gra uh, graph. This is, uh, which shows a discontinuous immediate jump of the number of women in parliament with the arrival of quotas, which is about five percentage points, uh, which is a 36% increase in the share of women in parliament. So this is stacking essentially all countries to the same zero point. So even if some country got the quotas in 95, others got 90, say, stacking so that we can compare and have a clean kind of uh, following the, the Goodman-Bacon type of uh, idea. So this is women. No, so what I was thinking is- like following. Following. Like, I beg your pardon? Yeah, so what I was thinking is the following, that if there is an anticipation that in some time these quotas would be in effect, 
then is it possible to imagine that the current male population in the electorate uh, they might you know start acting in line so as to reflect those ideas that shall be implemented by women or shall be favored uh what do you mean so before quotas or after quotas before actually the uh, quotas are in effect like do, do they start aligning already is that a possibility but wouldn't that reflect in the graph or shouldn't then the the rates start improving even before the quotas come about well yeah so that's uh, so so that brings me to this graph actually if you look at this is maternal mortality rates and you uh, see that joseph yes uh, i have i have a question so yes, uh, you mentioned you mentioned the goodman bacon paper and i have actually been working on a paper in with reference to so i have also been looking at the paper so the paper yeah. basically says that if there if there are heterogeneous treatment effects over time um, yeah. then it negatively weighs the long term effects right so yeah. then you mentioned that uh, it is possible that the effects become negative because of better measurement right so the yeah. women rep women representation improves and then because of better measurement the women the maternal mortality actually goes up is that a possibility you said right if it goes up then it will reduce it will bias the results against us right so what i'm saying is that if the treatment effects becomes negative at some point of time in the future then and the weights are also negative then it will actually um, overestimate the true treatment effect uh, if i understand the goodman bacon properly then it's uh, it talks about the single coefficient so this is like if i do a did i will see yeah. a drop in the single coefficient however this hides the fact that in some places over time if this is changing right here i don't mm -hmm. have the women up here and you can clearly see there's heterogeneous effect so here there is no problem of weighting because this is for every year it's a different thing here and we also do the goodman bacon de decomposition where you can see what percentage of the effect is coming from the yeah yeah the already treated late treated versus the early treated early treated versus the late treated mm. treated never treated etc and our results mostly 96% of the weight comes from uh, treated versus never treated so all right so you do you do their comparison uh, the decomposition thing and you you see that it does not come from there all right yes. answers my question thank you here here you see that the effects are heterogeneous over time so for over time it becomes much larger the effect so obviously if you didn't do what this if you didn't do this the coefficient that you get is is biased it's wrong right so even though we do right. the DC as well as a standard because that's what everybody does but you can see that you know it, it, the effect is strong after quotas and it's growing over time in fact 10 years out the maternal mortality rate falls by 16% right so it's it's a strong effect and even if you look at the did single coefficient which is a 10% decline we we regress it on gdp as well of course and we see that a similar decline in maternal mortality would require a 20% increase in gdp which is very high and just so that you know gdp does not have any effect on the women in parliament it does reduce maternal mortality however not by as much as having women in power does and we also look at increasing the the, the size of the quota so we we divide them into bins and we see that having quotas from 20 to 30% leads to a much larger decline than having a smaller amount, number of quotas right Num amount of quotas and the decline is of uh, 17.5% right and this is against the benchmark that mmr declined by 44% in the last 25 years so it's it's a very big effect right now let's Thank talk you. a bit about let's talk a bit about uh, the the mechanisms right so what the, it's of course some of you already mentioned the term it's a black box right what, what exactly are women doing right so there is so we think of it in a in a bunch of ways some of these uh, these are com complementary me mechanisms some of which we can explicitly test some others we cannot but that does not undermine our main story as as uh, i would try to argue so the first thing we try to think of is that 
are women first? Are they increasing health expenditure? Why do we think that they might expend, increase health expenditure? As we saw that, uh, as I talked about Miller's paper that have giving political voice to women increased public health expenditure, but also there is papers from the U.S. having more women legislators and senators in the U.S. increase state health expenditures. So we look at healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP, and we find that. So this is healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP. We find that there is some increase, but it is kind of noisily estimated. We don't really, so these confidence intervals are quite large and we can't really, that looks like there's a discontinuity, but we can't strongly say that, you know, it is indeed health expenditure as a percentage of GDP. And we also, this is a, the GDP is at the denominator. We looked at GDP, G GDP does not really uh, react to uh, more women in, uh, more, to quota. So that it's not the, the denominator driving this, but it's kind of ambiguous, unfortunately. So we see that there might be some increase, but it's not necessarily it's the only increase. We also look at development assistance for maternal health. So essentially there is data on aid disbursements across countries from donors to different receiving countries where they divide by what the aid was given for. And one of them is development assistance for maternal health. And we might have thought that maybe having more women in power meant that they could ask for more aid related to maternal health, but that's not the case. And that probably is not surprising given how these, a lot of these aid donors work and how they disperse aid. But this is one thing that is not happening. Health expenditure is unfortunately a bit ambiguous. The other thing we can think of or what we think is possible is that women allocate more of a given health budget to reproductive health, right? And they're allocating, so it's becoming more efficiently spent and is going towards female specific issues, such as skilled birth attendance, prenatal care utilization, which are actually two of the things that the WHO recommends for improving maternal health and maternal and child health. And we look at that and we see that both antenatal care and attended birth, skilled birth attendance is going up over the years, right? So this is, unfortunately, the data are more sparse. They're not, uh, available for the full set of countries. And yes, but this still gives us some strength to our, well, some, some idea of the mechanisms that having more women improves some of these variables, antenatal care and attendant, attended births. And if you look at the point estimates, you see that skilled birth attendance goes up by 7.4 percentage points. And if you, uh, against the benchmark that uh, in the last 25 years, there was an increase of 12 percentage points. So it's a huge effect. And uh, the, the point estimate for prenatal care utilization is about 4.9%, but it's not percentage points, but it's not precisely estimated, even though here we do see that in some years it has a, has a strong significant effect. We also look at things so for improvement, fertility and schooling. So for fertility, we have now data on only on birth rate. We would, if you know of some better data on exact measuring fertility, you can tell us. But we see that there is some fall in the birth rates after having quotas and an increase in women's schooling. Of course, when we plot in men's schooling, we also see an increase in men's schooling, not by as much, but there is an increase. And this is from the age group 15 to 19 years, which is exactly the age prior to women entering their reproductive age. So there is something happening here as well in this respect. And we call this empowerment. We can call it something else as well. And uh, we look at also some other things, which I will not show now in the interest of time. We look at female mortality in reproductive ages. There is some movement there. However, no movement in male mortality in reproductive ages, which is a kind of a placebo, and no evidence in the reduction in the rates of TB mortality, which is, again, something that kills a lot of people, but more men than women, actually. And these serve as placebos because these are either gender neutral or male specific things. And we see that it's actually female specific things that are improving. We also look at infant female to male infant mortality, and there's some movement there. Actually, female infant mortality falls by slightly more than male infant mortality as a result of quota. So it's really something specific to women's health that is improving. There are other possibilities, of course, which we don't think are contradictory to what I just talked about. These are complementary, and these might be happening. So it, it's possible that women achieve better reproductive health by reducing corruption, leakages, and uh, inefficiency. So there's a paper by Sonia and others which show using constituency level econ economic growth data in India, they show that economic growth improves more rapidly under female than male leaders in India. And lower corruption is one of the factors. 
women leaders might also promulgate information campaigns on women's rights, right? So things like they might, uh, which might affect either the input or on the outcomes directly without changing any resources allocated to it, just because there are information campaigns which might stimulate demand, get women to use existing antenatal services, or they might be making delivery failures public, uh, public service delivery failures public and motivating providers. So there are papers that are showing these. So these are all complementary mechanisms, but the idea is that having more women could make a difference in all these ways. And that's what we think about. Joseph, no. before, I mean, just one question, and this has to do with Sabya's question also. So imagine a situation that, you know, women are getting increasingly more engaged uh, in society and in, in various systems, right? And basically, you, you have a point where basically you move to the quotas. And now if the women's engagement is in some, some sense the enabling factor why women quotas work, then in some sense, the countries which did not see any quota implementation, you know, basically, you know, in those countries, if you were to think about a treatment of quotas, they would, there may not be this kind of effect, right? So maybe the fact that there are some countries that move to quota, right? It happened in countries where there was a, you know, an engagement of women in those countries. So you're right, internally, it's still consistent. The fact that, you know, these outcomes don't cheat, but you know, the women's participation in societies and it's a very important enabling factor for the quotas to work, right? So if you were to take your estimates and go to a country that did not implement a quota and which does not have women's engagement, then you may not get any of these effects. Okay. So, okay. I, okay. Okay. I understand your question. I, I think I understand your question. Let's hold on for this next slide. Maybe this will partly answer you, but if not, we, we talk about it. Okay. So, so this is essentially, I think, what you're kind of, uh, uh, kind of hinting at, that can we be sure that quotas are not picking up the impact of pre-quota pre women's rights movements or general progressive ten tendencies, right? Which is something that you were hinting at a little bit? Is that no, but Joseph, this is, this is an argument that it's women's engagement that leads to a fall in MMR. I'm not making that, I'm not making, I still think that you're picking up the impact of quotas, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the, the way it's estimated, the, the impact of quotas only come in when women are engaged, right? And the fact that these quotas were taken up at that particular point. So it could be that women are enabled, you know, it does not have any impact on any of your variables if women are not uh, in, in office, right? So that's true. So it doesn't take away the fact that in some sense there is an ITT, you know, there's your treatment effect for the treated that there is one that, you know, in these countries, they, you know, quotas did have this effect. But when you take that estimate and let's say you put it on a country which never had quotas, you're complete, you're basically implicitly, implicitly making an assumption that, you know, you would have women mobilization at the same way in which case, so you're basically picking up both the effects together, right? That would not be picked up in the robustness because just women's mobilization in these countries may have had no impact at all, you know, on, on all these outcomes. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That is exactly, I mean, in the next, Slide which we're coming to, I, I actually wanted to acknowledge that even if a grassroots movement that was in action before the quota, which created a preference for reducing MMR down, they, women might not have had the capacity to do so. So placing women in leadership positions has this capacity, right. which is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I acknowledge that. We acknowledge that. That's true. Because it makes the external validity a little bit problematic yeah, in some I, sense, right? Let, let me think about it a bit more. Yeah. I, I see what your point is, and I mean, at this moment, we, we've thought about it, as you can see, which, I, which is why I put it down here. But let, let, yeah, it's a good point. Let, let me, I should think about it a bit more, yeah. Okay, so now, coming back, so this, this is the in, the, in the robustness, one of the main things that we are thinking about is that, can we be sure, and this is what the referees have also been pointing at, can we be sure that quotas are not picking up the impacts of a pre-quota women's rights movement or general progressive tendencies in these countries, right? So the first thing is that, well, women's rights and progressive tendencies, these evolve sluggishly, right? And why, what we are doing is that we are using a sharp change at the date of legislation, the arrival of the quotas to, to get our effects. So of course, if these things are moving gradually over time, they might have some effect, but what we are using is something else altogether, right? 
And we explicitly allow for violations in the parallel training assumption. So this is the honest DID approaches, which is, which is it's called the honest DID, right? This is by Rambachan and Roth recently. So instead of assuming parallel trends, we construct valid 95% confidence intervals, assuming post quota trends in quota countries relative to non adopters would have followed prevailing paths in the pre quota period. Essentially, to cut this long story short, we allow for violations in, in, in uh, parallel trend assumptions, and we still see visually quite convincing, you know, allowing for violations that are effects on women in parliament as well as maternal mortality. The next thing we do is that we, we look at, instead of using quotas, uh, instead of using the women in parliament and, and, uh, and, and maternal mortality rates as two different outcome variables, we instrument women in parliament by quotas. And the reason we do that is that we, we think that, suppose quota legislation was just one man manifestation of a series of successes of women's rights movements then we might expect a direct impact of quota legis legislation and maternal mortality conditional upon the share of women in parliament, right? So we allow, in that case, obviously the exclusion restriction in this IV equation will be violated, but this method from Connolly and others in the Aristat paper allows for such small violations in the exclusion restriction and lets us calculate bounds on the IV uh, estimates. And we find that the bounds are quite meaningful. So we do that. Further, we actually look at a number of potential omitted variables, which might be manifestations of pre-progressive movements. If there are progressive movements happening beforehand already in time, which might, of course, part of them might be the, the grassroots movement that Obiruta was talking about. And we, we look at a bunch of things like for, for doing that. Some of this we've already generated and we've generated only yesterday, actually, some of this, the women's rights graph. So, We've not even had time to think too much about them. But we are also looking at women's protests uh, across countries. We are trying to construct data from Afrobarometer and World Value Survey and gender attitude. Unfortunately, it looks like the data are not that good to allow us to draw proper event studies, but we will try. We are looking at abortion legislation across countries. We also look at direct outcomes like labor force participation, women on corporate votes across countries. We've not done these. These are all in the pipeline. But I can already show you the women's rights that, that came out, uh, that we, 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 we derived the last uh, yesterday, actually. So this is the Women's Business and Law Index from the World Bank, which shows the economic opportunities for women. Then from the King Arely, the Kiri data set, we can look at women's social rights, political rights, and economic rights, how they're moving. And you can see in the rights variables, there's a clear, you know, there is no pre-trend, really. This is kind of flat here, right? Women's political rights, of course, even if there's no periods, the by definition, because we have quotas and more women in parliament, there is an uptick there after the quotas. In women's economic rights, it looks like there is a downward trend, and I couldn't explain to you why that is the case, but we look at these, and this is like, to be entirely honest with you, this is what it is, right? We look at the rights variables, how they're moving before time, and we don't really find any pre-trend in most of them, right, which would explain uh, our maternal mortality decline. So Joseph, just uh, just the typekeeping announcement. We've got about twenty five minutes left. Ah oh, yeah, okay. I have plenty of time on my uh, plenty of time. Thank you very much. Okay, and then what we, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, as I was saying to you in response to Obiuga's uh, question, of course it's uh, it's possible what you were saying, but which is something we have to think about more. But what we think is that even if women wanted to make a change, they lacked the capacity until they were given the policymaking power in, 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 uh, in the form of quotas, right? In the form of seats in the parliament. And uh, beyond that, we also look at controls for predictors of quota legislation, right? So we look at what are the things that are predicting quotas. So we look at, at the political science literature and they talk about you know, overseas development assistance, the number of peacekeepers. So when the UN gives you some peacekeepers, they impose on you this, which the UN wanted to do anyway. And that comes out uh, slightly significant. Uh, we look at economic rights, which some people have talked about, and we can adjust our, our estimates by all of these. But I mean, we leave them out from our main estimates, including them make no difference, right? And then we look at things like whether it's a left-wing government, right-wing governments, how many years they've been in power, if it's politically polarized. These are the things that a bunch of people have talked about, and in political science, they've thought 
might be explaining what quotas are, adding these make no difference, essentially, right, when we control for this. And beyond this, we do a bunch of other, you know, robustness tests like region year fixed effect, using MMR from the DHS, weighting by country population, leaving India and China out, level versus log, which is what Deaton pointed out, that some of these you have to look at levels, removing high-income countries, conditioning on health expenditure, directly accounting for uh, uncertainty in the measures of maternal mortality using double bootstrapping procedure. And we also present in the paper DID estimates from uh, like the sim single coefficient DID estimates. And we also see that candidate quotas, which are the weaker form of quotas, don't really have an effect on maternal mortality. Even though there seems like an upward thing here on, on women in parliament, they're not significant, but these are these quotas were implemented mostly in Latin American countries where the baseline rate of maternal mortality is already a lot lower. That might explain this, but also we adjust for baseline maternal mortality rates. So we see that in countries where the rates are higher, quotas have a higher effect. So we do that. And we have, so one of the referees actually asked us to look at India and because, uh, uh, and see if we can get some subnational estimates. So maternal mortality data for India was also not that's easily available. We did find some data from the uh, uh, from the last couple of decades, and we put them together, and we do some subnational estimates. So this is the kind of thing uh, the the using the staggered implementation of local representation of women at the state level. So this is local implement uh, local seats are reserved for women, but different states have implemented them in different times. So then we look at the Indian states, and we see kind of before the arrival of the quotas, there is some, there's kind of, there's no difference. But after that, there seems to be a drop. But these data are from a few large states in India, and there are very few data points, obviously the con confidence intervals are quite large. But this is, this is what it is. So the, these are data from India. It does look like after having more women's representation, even in India, there is a discontinuous drop in, 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 in maternal mortality rates. So there are some other things we are trying to do. Of, of course, this is uh, we, we are trying to take into account first, technically speaking, all the latest state of the art in this kind of DID event study literature. So the, the recent things that have come out, the AR, the, the recent AR paper by Shez Mahta, which is actually 2020 now, I think. Shez Mahta et al., the Calaway and Santana, who talks about you know time varying treatment effects, what you need to do, the adjustments, the waiting. This we've already done. I'm not showing you here. This we have thinking we might do. As I said, we also do the goodman bacon decomposition. And if you look at the single coefficient DID, uh, the weight is the highest on the treated versus the non-treated group. That is explaining most of the coefficient. Right? And of course, the other things we would like to do is to fill in a bit better the black box between political participation and health investments. So what we are thinking of is perhaps we can look at a database of laws around women's health and see whether after quotas, these laws actually get passed, or even look within a, an individual country and do a case study and see whether having quotas did make a difference in the kind of laws they were passing. In particular, we are trying to do a text analysis of the parliamentary proceedings for Zimbabwe. And well, Zimbabwe is interesting because A, the, the parliamentary proceedings are available in English on the website for the last decade, decade and a half. And that was the period in between which they had quotas. So we can see after quotas if there has been some, you know, reprioritization in the kind of things people have been talking about. So that's one thing we are trying to also think about. So that brings me to the conclusion. Uh, so neither, what we think is that neither increases in country income nor advances in medical technology are sufficient for potential improvements in maternal mortality. The technology has been around for years, but maybe we're not doing enough to solve it because it's not part of the political health, the public health discourse, because women are not represented enough. And we find large impacts of raising women's influence on in policymaking. And there is recent papers, this is I think from India, Baskaran and I think Sonia's paper, where they talk about how gender quotas actually, the cost is low. It doesn't have a negative effect on GDP. In our data, obviously we don't find it, but in general, it's not as if it negatively affects some other things, right? So it's, it's a low cost intervention in that, that sense. It's already at scale. So it's not like a tiny RCT and we don't know how to implement it at the country level. This is already at scale. And this potentially is widely relevant, right? Because maternal mortality is still very high. 
at 216 per 100,000 births, much higher in some, other, some countries. And women's parliamentary share is only at 20%. So there's a huge potential for further improvement. And the fact that part of it is not income, part of it is there's some political economy hidden there for why these rates are not coming down can also be seen from the US case where there's huge variation across states, which obviously is not in our paper. And some places they're doing much worse. The rates have been going up over time in the last few years, which is quite striking because it's, uh, well, maybe not striking if you know the political economy of the US, but for me, it was quite striking. And uh, to, to finish, I just want to point out, of course, there are some clear intrinsic reasons why we should bring down MMR, why we should think about what to do about reducing maternal mortality. Intrinsically, it's something that we should do, but economically speaking as well, beyond this, if that's, as if that's not enough, there is also other effects such as uh, re reducing MMR has shown, shown to affect women's human capital decisions, fertility decisions, labor force participation, and thereby next generation's human capital in a bunch of papers, right? So this is something we really need to think about and, 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 and try to bring down. So that's essentially it for me. I don't remember if I have not answered some of your questions, so please feel free to ask now. Uh, Joseph, there are just uh, there are two questions in the chat. Um, okay. Do you want to take both of them or do you want to do it one by one? What do you yeah, how do I see? Let me see. I'm not very, I mean, at work we use Microsoft Teams, so I'm not very sure how to see all the things in Zoom. I can, I can read out the, the questions if you want. Okay, okay if, that's, if they, you don't mind. Yeah, so the first is, are, are women legislators uh, designing better policies so that the uptake of services increases or is there just more expenditure on the same policies? Um, that's... So are women legislators increasing the expenditure or more expenditure in the same policies? Is that the question? Uh, increasing expenditure or designing better policies so that the uptake of services increases. So we can't entirely answer that, but we, what we did see is that there is some increase in health expenditure. Of course, it's very noisy, so it's ambiguous. We don't know if health expenditure is going up, but it's more likely with and without health expenditure going up, it's better allocation towards these services. That's what we think. But of course, we can't rule out. As I showed you the health expenditure results, they were, there was some increase, but it looks like even without a substantial increase, antenatal care, uh, spilled birth attendance, they are going up. Right. The second question is, have you uh, looked at uh, rates of child marriage? Child marriage, but uh, I don't know if we have cross-country data on that. Uh, no, we haven't looked at it. No. Right. That's that's a question. So uh, now, if anyone else has any questions, please go ahead. Um. Hi, uh, Joseph. I have a question. So I was wondering if we have similar cross-country evidence on, uh, say, the role of women administrators, women administrators versus, I mean, as opposed to women politicians. Cross-country evidence, I not that I can think of, no. But it would be interesting to see. Right. But there again, I mean, here, it's nice that we can use this abrupt legislation to come at the causal effects. If you just regress the number of the effects, you know, use the number of women administrators, I'm not sure you can get something out of it. But it's an interesting question. No, I don't know of evidence of, on that. Just to follow uh, up on Shonak, you could just can see I, whether it Can I ask a method, methods question? Yes, of course. Yeah, could you explain this, uh, your, your approach to dealing with the parallel trends again? I'm not familiar with this new paper. Uh, which one? You mentioned the, the, the Ram Bachchan and Roth. Yeah, okay, you, yeah, because this just came in yesterday from my co-author. So essentially what I, what, what I understand is that you allow. No, no. What have uh, you done? I'm asking what's the, what, how have you dealt with it? Can you explain that a little more clearly? Uh, so we do, we allow for the parallel trends to be violated. And then there is some, 
the technique honestly i do not remember because this is just come in and this is from my uh, from damian but we allow for the parallel trends to be violated and we allow for the trends to be moving as if there was no intervention so the post quota trends in the quota countries relative to the non adopters we allow them to follow the prevailing path from the pre quota period so we allow them to be not parallel but beyond that i'm honestly i i really can't tell you more at this moment okay but i can get back to you with that and and, and what were you doing with the leads and lags can you explain that a little more clearly uh, you mean in the main uh, here no i knew a question so here you had an mean, equation before this okay okay so so there is so for each country adopts the quota or it doesn't so in a did kind of thing you will only have the post times you know the quota the 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 quota adoption or non adoption here we have it for each year an interaction prior to the adoption of the quota and after the adoption of quota so this is 10 leads this is 10 lags so for each country there is it, there is a there's a dummy variable which is switching on if it's a quota adopter or non adopter and then that is interacted with the the year so for each year there's a separate coefficient both prior to the arrival of the quota and after the uh, arrival of the quota which is what is reflected here so each of this is an you're plotting the you're plotting the difference exactly so this is the coefficient of on the quota variable for each year separately right and why year, why is why is the confidence interval appear to narrow as you approach the uh the zero year because as you go further out so this is data from 1990 to 2015 so some countries which adopted the quotas in the near the middle we have a lot of data to the side but this zero point for a country that adopted quota in 1995 is not really a, the, 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 so this so the country which adopted the quota in 1995 this oh, is no, that's by definition zero i understand yes. so if but, you go back in time we don't have data on that country so as you go further away the data becomes sparse so that is why the confidence intervals become larger does that make sense because in in this part we have a lot of countries the whole set but as you go further away the sample becomes sparser so that's why the the, the confident intervals go up okay uh joseph i have a question um regarding you know one of the variables that i felt was little disturbing was this peacekeeping thing right yeah. in in adoption so do we know anything about conflict in these countries um uh, in terms of you know so it seems like there are a lot of sub saharan african countries there are peacekeepers you know there is stress which causes uh, you know uh, mmrs anyways to to fall so do we know anything about that i mean you could expect that you know that once peacekeepers come in everything is quiet conflict goes down uh, stress on mothers is less and therefore mmr falls right so is there uh, you know do we have any data that on that we could show on that uh, the con conflict data is actually quite uh, easily available we can check mm -hmm. how the conflicts are changing i mean i have a bunch of papers on conflict yeah that's why i mentioned because you see the peacekeepers as well as the first lag it seems yeah. that well they well signs are kind of opposite but i guess you have both of them together so uh, if you have them you know it seems that if peacekeepers have some predictive power right in being able to predict when quotas come in which means basically that you know either the us or the un went in and and then there could just be independent impacts because of you know things getting quieter things getting less confrontational and we know that there's a literature on on stress and maternal stress and maternal mortalities so those could be reasons too yeah yeah we can we can check what is happening there yeah we can check yeah it's a good point we didn't think about it but yeah it's a good point yeah any more questions okay so then uh, let me thank joseph for a clear seminar where everyone understood and so there were not that many questions in the end though we asked him a lot of questions during the talk so 
so thanks. Uh, uh, Joseph, you can uh, kind of stick around and we can chat. Uh, others, um, you know, if you don't have questions, then uh, you could leave. If someone uh, wants to talk to Joseph, I'm happy to yield some time to the person. You know, you can have a sh short chat with him. But I mean, others should please uh, leave. Thank you. <laughs>